Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is one of a series looking at major financial fraud. And financial fraud is something that absolutely fascinates me. Because in the world of business, you assume that everybody is trustworthy, everybody is working towards the same goal. But unfortunately, there are some criminals out there, some people who decide that there's other ways of doing things, fraudulent ways, misleading people, hoodwinking people. And it's only with the benefit of hindsight that these schemes and ideas come to light. And in this video today, I want to talk about the OG fraudster, Charles Ponzi. Now, Charles Ponzi is infamous in the world of fraud. Everybody's heard about the Ponzi scheme. But at the time, it seemed like the best thing since sliced bread. Charles Ponzi was a highly charismatic Italian who came to the USA in the 1920s and told everybody about an amazing get-rich-quick scheme. It seemed too good to be true. And obviously, with hindsight, it was too good to be true. So in today's video, I want to give you a bit more detail on Charles Ponzi, who he was, what he did, and how he managed to get away with this incredible scheme. Charles Ponzi was born in Italy in 1882 to a poor family that was rich in name. When he was young, his mother would tell him about the family's long lost riches and planted a seed in her little boy's head that he would be the one to restore the family name and lift them back up to their rightful place in society. And this idea stuck with Ponzi until the end of his life. Charles Ponzi's parents used what little money they had to enroll him at the University of Rome but Ponzi wasn't interested in school and he ran through all of his family's savings just to prove how rich he was to his friends. The foolish spender never finished his degree, but he did manage to put the Ponzi name into the realms of history, albeit for the wrong reasons. Charles Ponzi arrived in the USA in 1903 and worked as a dishwasher at a restaurant where he slept on the floor because he couldn't afford to pay the rent. In order to improve his prospects, Ponzi moved to Canada where he found a job that was run by an Italian named Luigi Zarossi. This period marked the beginning of the concept of Ponzi's money-making scheme. Luigi Zarossi offered his clients outrageously high interest rates. But as he wasn't making sufficient returns to be able to pay this interest, he took money from new investors to pay out dividends to the old investors. So long as the money kept coming in, the customers didn't notice. But less than a year after Charles Ponzi started working for him, Zarossi packed his bags and fled to Mexico with his client's cash. Once again, Charles Ponzi was out of work, but the seed of his scheme had now been sown. After his boss disappeared, Charles Ponzi was broke once more, and he forged a cheque for $423. The police caught him, and Ponzi was sentenced to three years in prison on the outskirts of Montreal. 17 days after being released from prison, he was arrested again, this time for helping Italians to cross the border from Canada into the USA. He was sentenced to another two years in prison, this time in the USA. After leaving prison, Ponzi headed back to Boston, where he met his wife, a beautiful young woman by the name of Rose Marie Necco. He started a magazine business called The Trader's Guide, but it failed as he wasn't able to sell enough advertising. One day, he received a letter from Spain requesting a copy of his magazine, and the request included an international postage reply coupon. The postage reply coupon could be swapped to buy stamps in any country in the world, and was the only form of international currency at the time. Charles Ponzi realised that he could buy a dollar's worth of these coupons in Europe and exchange them in the US for five dollars worth of stamps to create a huge profit. This idea marked the beginning of his criminal plans. Ponzi needed to raise money to get his scheme going, so he headed to the banks and asked for a loan. One bank president laughed in his face and told him his small account was more trouble than it was worth. He kicked Ponzi out of his office and told him never to return again. Ponzi decided that if the banks wouldn't lend him money, he would sell the idea directly to the public. What he had learnt from his former employer in Canada was that he could raise money as long as he offered people a very high return. Ponzi set up a company called Security Exchange Company, or SEC, and told investors that he would take in any amount of money and pay them back a whopping 50% interest in 90 days. This proposal went down very well with the general public and everybody wanted to give Ponzi their money. In the first month of business, the scheme raised $1,700. After a few months, Ponzi was bringing in around $30,000 a week and after six months, he had raised $2.5 million, which in today's money would be worth over $30 million. Ponzi invested the money into a variety of banks in Boston. 
He deposited so much money into them that he knew if he were to withdraw it all at once, it would be the end of them. These banks therefore became reliant on him and he ended up being a majority shareholder of the bank that had kicked him out just a few months earlier when he asked for a loan. Charles Ponzi was the talk of the town and the most respected person around. He drove his flash car everywhere and impressed clients with how rich he was. But unfortunately at the core of his scheme lay a big fat lie. The editor of the Boston Post, Richard Grozier, felt that something was wrong and decided to investigate Ponzi. He published an article in the Boston Post describing what Ponzi was doing. He hoped that once his actions were printed in black and white, people would understand how impossible the whole thing was. However, it actually had the opposite impact and caused more people to arrive at Ponzi's office with cash in hand ready to invest. Financial journalist Clarence Barron joined in and explained that Ponzi's returns, once calculated, were mathematically impossible. He published a paper explaining how improbable it was that Ponzi's business could make these returns. Ponzi knew that he had to stop accepting money, at least for a while, until the newspapers calmed down and law enforcement stopped snooping around his business. The moment he announced that he would not be accepting more clients, people went crazy. There were outbreaks of violence outside his office and people forced themselves into the building through the windows. Finally, on Friday, July the 30th, the Boston Post wrote something that shut everybody up. New York Postmaster says there are not enough international reply coupons in the world to make the fortune that Ponzi claims. That headline made it clear to everyone. Ponzi had tricked them. Charles Ponzi didn't wait for the police to arrest him. He went down to the station and turned himself in before anyone could humiliate him in front of his wife. Ponzi kept getting more and more charges thrown at him. He decided to represent himself in court and arrived impeccably dressed as always and amazed everyone with his sharp wit and quick responses. Despite this, he was found guilty and sentenced to four years in prison. He was released early for good behaviour, however three months later he was arrested on additional charges. This time he wasn't able to sweet talk his way out of it and received a jail sentence of nine years. He was allowed to go free on bail while his appeal was pending. Ponzi saw this as the perfect time to run off. He faked his suicide and boarded an Italian ship under a false name to work as a dishwasher and a waiter. But Ponzi couldn't keep his mouth shut for long and let his secret slip to one of the passengers. News spread on board like wildfire and Ponzi was soon escorted back to prison for good. After the scheme collapsed, some lucky investors managed to get in and out of the whole ordeal quickly with no harm done. Others got back around 37% of the money they'd invested but most ended up with nothing. In total, it was estimated that the people of Boston lost $15 million in Ponzi scheme, which would equate to around $180 million today. Charles Ponzi was released from prison in 1934 and deported back to Italy. His wife Rose stayed in Boston, and despite the great love between them, she divorced him because they couldn't make a long-distance relationship work. Ponzi tried to make some money from his story by writing his memoirs, but no one seemed to care about him that much anymore. He moved to Brazil in 1939 and died a decade later at the age of 66. Before he died, he told a reporter that he had never intended for things to happen as they had and that he really believed he would be able to pay everybody back. Hopefully you found this video interesting and informative. If you've liked what I've said today, then please give me a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and thanks for watching all the way through to the end.